Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on an introduction to the independent samples t-test. As always, if you find this video useful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. I certainly appreciate it. The independent samples t-test is also referred to as the student's t-test. And it's an inferential statistic. So it's a statistic that we run when we want to infer something from a sample to a population. So we want to figure out something about a population when we only have access to a sample, which is the situation for a majority of analyses of data collected during different research studies. Oftentimes we don't have access to an entire population. We only have access to a sample for logistical reasons or financial reasons or both. The independent samples t-test gives us information about the difference between means in unrelated groups. And it does this specifically by providing what's referred to as a calculated t-value. And we compare that t-value, that t-statistic generated by the independent samples t-test to a critical t-value. And if that calculated t-value is greater than the critical t-value, we reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis in the case of an independent samples t-test is that the population means are equal. The alternative hypothesis is that the population means are not equal. So the independent samples t-test generates this calculated t-value. We can find the critical t-value. Uh, however, most of the time with the software that we'd be using to calculate an independent samples t-test, for example, Excel or SPSS, it's going to give us a probability value. And we compare that probability value to what we refer to as the alpha. And in social sciences, the alpha is often set at 0.05 or 5%. So if the p-value is less than 5%, we would reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than 5%, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis or accept the alternative hypothesis. The p-value or probability value specifically tells us what is the probability of making the observations that we made based on random error alone if the null hypothesis were true. So in the case of an alpha of 5%, we want the probability of making that observation through random error alone to be less than 5% in order to reject the null hypothesis. So now let's take a look at the elements of an independent samples t-test. What do we need to run an independent samples t-test? What works for it and what doesn't work? Well, we need one independent variable and this independent variable needs to be dichotomous. So it's nominal and it has exactly two levels. For an independent samples t-test, we can't use an independent variable that has more than two levels or that's measured at a continuous level of measurement. So an example of a common independent variable that we could use in a t-test would be gender. Gender has two levels, male and female those levels are nominal. So gender would fit with the criteria for an independent samples t-test. Another element of the independent samples t-test is we need one dependent variable. One and only one dependent variable and it must be measured the interval or ratio level of measurement. So the interval level of measurement means that between each observation, there's equal distance. For example, the Fahrenheit scale. The difference between 70 degrees and 71 degrees is the same as the difference between 95 and 96 degrees. However, with the interval level measurement, zero on the scale doesn't represent a true absence of the construct that we're measuring. So an example of the Fahrenheit scale, zero doesn't represent an absence of heat. A ratio level of measurement is the same as interval, 
except the zero is a true zero. For example, if you're measuring weight in pounds and you have a weight of zero pounds, that's an absence of weight. That's the ratio level of measurement. Also with an independent samples t-test, the groups need to be independent, unrelated groups. A participant, for example, cannot belong to both levels of the independent variable. They have to be grouped in one level or the other. So for an independent samples t-test, we have one dichotomous independent variable, we have one dependent variable, and the groups are independent. Now let's take a look at the assumptions for the independent samples t-test. When we conduct inferential statistics, we have to make sure that the data meet the assumptions for the particular statistic that we are conducting. And for the independent samples t-test, we have two assumptions, homogeneity of variance and normality. So homogeneity of variance means that the variances of the two groups are equal. So for example, with the male and female example as a dichotomous variable, if you were measuring a construct like depression, so we have depression scores. So we have depression scores for the males and the females in a study. The variance in the depression scores for the males would have to be equal to the variance of the depression scores for the females. And we test homogeneity of variance oftentimes using what's referred to as the Levine's test. Just like an independent samples t-test, the Levine's test generates a p-value. And if you're using a, an alpha of 0.05, as is fairly common, you would reject the null hypothesis when you have a Levine's test with a p-value below 0.05. So in that case, you would assume that you do not have homogeneity of variance. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis of the Levine's test, you assume that you do have homogeneity of variance. If you violate the assumption of homogeneity of variance, for example, in calculating independent samples t-test and SPSS, there is a correction that you can interpret that's labeled equal variances not assumed. So you can interpret a row equal variances assumed or equal variance is not assumed. So homogeneity of variance is an assumption of an independent samples t-test, but there is a way with the correction to still get a result even if that assumption is violated. Then we have the assumption of normality. And what this means that for each level of the independent variable, the dependent variable is normally distributed. So again, the case of gender and depression all the depression scores, all the scores from the depression inventory for males, all those scores would have to be normally distributed, and all the scores for the females would have to be normally distributed. We determine if data meet the assumption of normality using a variety of statistics, including the Shapiro-Wilk. That's a common statistic for testing normality. And when looking at the results of a Shapiro-Wilk test, Again, we're using an alpha of 0 0.05. If there is a p-value less than 0 0.05, you would assume that the data are not normally distributed. If it's greater than 0 0.05, that provides evidence that the data are normally distributed. However, you'd want to look at other statistics as well, like skewness, uh, for example, and you'd want to look at the histograms for each of the levels of the dependent variable. So those depression scores across both the males and females. You'd want to look at a histogram to help inform any decision about normality. I hope you found this introduction to the independent samples t-test to be helpful. Thanks for watching.